Hannah Talk. What is up, Dragon Ball fans? Simon here. Welcome to Hannah Talk. Hope you all are fantastic. Today I'm here with a very special guest. Now she is an actress who is best known to fans as the voice of Kid Goku from the original Dragon Ball series, but she's also gone on to the further into the Dragon Ball universe in being the voice of Kid Gohan in Dragon Ball Z, as well as voicing characters in a variety of shows, such as KO in OKKO okay, Let's Be Heroes, Lupin the Third, Yu Yu Hakusho, Detective Conan, and so much more. Please welcome the amazing Stephanie Naldini. It is going really well in Australia, Stephanie. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so glad that you reached out and we could make this happen. Absolutely. It's, that's absolutely fantastic. And same with me as well. It's an absolute honor to have you on this. Oh, wonderful. Yes, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. That's no problem. Now, obviously, get, now obviously with what's been happening with the virus and the pandemic over the last few years, how have you been keeping things up, especially on the acting and the entertainment side of things? Well, funny you should ask. I mean, pretty much for me, everything I, I do or that I've been doing with, with show business involves an audience and it involves people and being around people. So, um, yeah, the COVID thing was um, horrible for live entertainment and for some of the a lot of the projects I was doing. I was also teaching voice and piano lessons, which had to go to Zoom, which were absolutely nothing like working with with uh, kids in person, absolutely not. Um, I had a, a show band that was, um, you know, we were touring and performing and you know, we had to shut down our band, our, uh, our quartet, um, about 60 or 70 gigs had to be canceled, unfortunately. So no, I, I basically had to live on savings and come up with creative ways to still maintain some productivity <laughs> you know, I had to get really um, creative with all of that, and um, I was doing more narrations and radio ads, um, more so than anything, and, um, you know, getting stuff done around the house, and learning how to cook amazing meals. <laughs> I think we all, we all had to adjust to this, you know, worldwide pandemic, which, yes, it was, was hard on everybody. I know some business, business most businesses suffered and some actually did better you know there were you know just depended on your um your job and i know a lot of people learned how to how to uh work from home you know which i you know i did get yeah i still received a few auditions here and there and i was able to you know audition and send files um electronically so that, that didn't necessarily shut down completely but it was definitely a huge huge setback um for what i do personally which is more in person performing Right. That's definitely true that you mentioned about that, especially mentioned about in the fact how voice acting in particular, and as you mentioned, like the voice acting industry and the animation industry was kind of the one, there was kind of the two industries that sort of didn't really stop as far as what they had to go through during the pandemic and stuff, because as a lot of voice actors, and I've spoken with a lot of voice actors before, they've spoken about having uh -huh. their own home studios, and a lot of them right. actually had their own home studios long before the pandemic, I think, had taken place so you can sort of right. think of it as a way of like hey we're just getting ourselves ready for when the coming apocalypse comes down upon us <laughs> right and and some yes were and, and i was one of those that did have you know a setup to to do quite a bit from home um so that 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 didn't stop me there it was just more the live performance side of things and the um in-person uh, meet and greets and appearances as a guest at comic-con pop culture conventions and comic book stores i mean all of those had to shut down um which was something i was doing on the regular uh and thankfully i'm back at it more than ever now but but uh pretty much you know it, it primarily affected 2020 2021 and uh things started to kind of come back a little bit in 2022 fortunately but yeah 20 and 21 were, were pretty hard we were pretty hard hit uh, me and my band members um it was sad we missed each other we missed playing um we had really been you know been working together for many many years and um it was just you know to not be able to to see our audiences and and to fulfill those commitments was was pretty heartbreaking and then of course there's the aspect of the the um the livelihood part of it you know making a living and paying our bills and 
you know, that, that had to stop, had an abrupt stop. So, you know, um, but in my line of work, you know, um, I kind of got into the habit of saving at a young age and for, for things that, you know, are unforeseen, like, you know, losing a job or maybe not have any gigs for a few weeks or, you know, I, I, I've always had to do that being self-employed. So I kind of was already in a practice of, of that, but I just didn't expect it to be such a drastic uh, a, tra- a drastic hit to lose so much work uh, for well over a year or two. That was that was hard. Absolutely, and I think I can definitely speak from experience on that because as many people don't know, or as many people do know, that I'm primarily a musician and a teacher myself, and I, uh... and I, and I've been through that experience for the last couple of years. Well, more so around 2020 though. But the thing is though. I'm primarily a freelance musician or a session musician, so I had to get a lot of like work done online, like just mostly right. the center across my own recording studio, which is actually the path that I wanted to go down as well as doing the live setting as well. So I didn't really stop music in the grand sense of things. More, it was more, it was mostly right. keeping it on the online circuit, but I know for a fact that we also had like a lot of musicians, especially here in Australia and in the Melbourne music scene as well, We've had musicians do like home perform in uh, online performances and like online gigs and stuff. So I imagine that similar sort of thing would have happened. Like you would have either done performances at home or just done like live performance sessions just with each of your band members, just Skyping from wherever they wherever they happen to be living at. Right, right, and there's definitely there's definitely ways to record from home or. You know, or even record at a at a studio that may, uh, you know, have one band member come in one at a time and things like that. You know, but but primarily what we what we were doing in nine, you know, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, well, even before that, um, was live performance. So that that's why we were hit particularly hard, being that we had booked you know weddings and private parties and clubs and um, festivals and you know stuff that we did for city concerts and holiday, you know, senior homes and just different, you know, Christmas party, all of that had to go. Uh, we were able to keep a couple of the, of the gigs, um, but it just wasn't the same. I mean, a lot of people didn't show up. We didn't have a, a, as big of an audience and we had to kind of like, you know, a lot of the band members were, we were basically each one of us one at a time would get COVID. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, I can't do it. Let's get a sub, you know, and there's ways around it, but but yeah, it was pretty hard, pretty hard hit. I had to actually take a few jobs that weren't the weren't in my line of work just to stay busy and feel productive and, and really, you know, to be around people, which I actually like people a lot. So I love being around them. So I was able to kind of, you know, figure things out. And, you know, I was able to work with my manager because we were living in the same home. So that worked out. Um, but yeah, no, it's great to be back out and about and feel like things have kind of normalized, you know, to some degree. Absolutely. No, I'm. That's fantastic. That's absolutely wonderful. And I feel the exact same way, especially for myself as a teacher and a musician. And last year, the way I look at it, and to all the listeners out there, I often viewed 2022 as being like a year of rebirth or being born again, essentially, because of the last couple of years that we went through with the pandemic. And now this year is sort of the, depending on what your definition of the word is, a return to normalcy in a way. Especially because, like, I remember when I went to Supernova Comic Con just a couple of weeks ago in Melbourne, Australia, which, to everyone out there that has seen my Instagram, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and just right. to see the amount of people that were there for Comic Con compared to when it was a couple of years ago, when Australia was hit the hardest, not in terms of the virus, but really just in terms of the actual lockdowns that we were going through at that time. It was like... It was night and day, absolute night and day. And now, and now especially not just having done Comic-Con, but also done doing gigs with my own band as well, which for all the listeners out there that have watched my music channel, we've officially got ourselves a brand new name. It's no longer Fennec, which is F-E-N-N-E-C, but it's Fennex, F-E-N-N-E-C-S. So just thought I'd get that out there for, anyone's, for anyone that's wondering. So I agree oh. with you. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you very much. We only just changed the name, I think, just recently, actually. But it's been under Fennec for uh, quite a long time. But 
how that story sort of came about, I need to do a separate video about this at some point. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I need to do a separate video about how the, how Hannah Talk got started and everything. But um, how Phoenix sort of came about in that sense was um, I actually joined up with the group just three years ago, um, at the end of 2020, just as we, as just as I felt like Melbourne in particular, Melbourne, Australia, was getting out of that whole year-long lockdown. And I've known the members of my group for a number of years now. And they said, hey, would you like to become our drummer? I said, I said, we've got this gig coming up. I joined up, we played. I said, is the office still available to join your group? And the rest was basically history. And we've been slowly starting to add the members to the group and expanding the sound a lot more as well ever since then. So it's been, it's been fantastic. I'm happy for you and I'm happy for your band members. That's amazing. It's interesting we have that in common. Absolutely. I, that's yeah. definitely a thing with a lot of voice actors is that a lot of them have had experiences within like the theater side of things or in the music or having that musical background or a lot of musical experience in that sense. Yeah. And that really helps to enhance their performance as well. Like for example, oh, like de mm -hmm. for the timing of, uh, the, when you're dubbing and getting the rhythm and the timing of actually ma matching the mouth flaps, it's, it's definitely aided me and then being able you know being a singer since i was you know a child singing in, in and on and off the stage with musical theater and in live performing touring show bands i mean i i had a, a great handle on how to how to manipulate my voice already to emulate different singers and styles of music so it, it definitely was a, a key component in me being able to have a significant amount of control on my voice um when it came time to start auditioning for for you know, voice acting jobs. Absolutely, that's that's absolutely fantastic. And that's definitely true with a lot of the voice actors I've interviewed in the past that have mentioned about like being musicians, of course. Like for example, Brina Palencia, who many people remember as Chopper from One Piece and as well as Chaozu during, I think, Dragon Ball Kai at that time. And as well as a whole bunch of other voice actors in the past as well, which is, it's, mm -hmm. it's certainly, they can use that to their advantage, which is just absolutely right. fantastic. Now, I actually had an opportunity to sing animation, sorry to interrupt, and, and some animation <laughs> themes, um, because I, a lot of people don't realize that, that back, I say back in the day, you know, back when I was recording regularly as Gohan on Dragon Ball Z and Goku on Dragon Ball, um, I worked with Brave Combo, which is the band that was hired to basically recreate some of the anime themes from uh, specifically Case Closed um we did some for uh blue gender as well as kitty grade um and fortunately being a singer and helping translate well i wasn't a translator but we got the japanese lyrics and were, were lyrically able to make them work in english and um as a, as a result when we had auditions i was able to i was chosen to sing some of them so um one for, one was also for yu yu haka show that was my first one sayonara bye bye um, and a lot of the, the fans and maybe some, a lot of your listeners don't realize that um, I, I sang on a bunch of those, <laughs> so, wow. which is great to be able to cross that path in, under the same studio <laughs> and then being able to direct other singers and bring other singers in, in, in for auditions to get a, a wide variety of voices involved. That's fantastic. That's absolutely wonderful. Now, obviously getting into the ver very beginning of your career, like, how did you get started in acting? Like, where did that all start for you? Well, uh, I, um, as a child, a young child, I knew that I wanted to pursue music, a, a career singing, using my voice. Um, and as a result, I, you know, was singing on all, all my free time. I was singing to disco music, my dad's records, my mom's records. Uh, I would sing and emulate anything and everything that, that, that caught my ear. And as a result, it became a natural thing for me to pick up an instrument, which ended up being the piano. We had a piano at home and I started playing the piano by ear and, and making up songs. And as a, you know, I also wrote poetry, which therefore could be translated into lyrics. And I was writing my own songs just for fun on my own free time. And, and also, um, recording onto, you know, at the time it was a cassette player, cassette recorder. I would record um, not only me singing, but also playing piano, singing along, and playing around with my voice. I, I would, I would, um, you know, try to emulate uh, 
my family members, my brother, my, you know, my aunts and uncle, my, even my babysitter, I would, I would find a way to like interview them and then try to emulate their voice. And then of course, you know, with cartoons, you know, we all kind of grew up with the cartoons on TV and on, on Saturday mornings. And I found myself emulating, you know, Mel Blanc and some of the other you know, character voices. I just had a natural knack for that. And so from doing it pretty much my whole life uh, on the side, it became natural for me to be able to get involved in theater in school, growing up in musicals and trying out for the play and, and being involved with the thespians and the, dr- and the drama club and whatever else was, was there. And, and naturally being a singer and loving music so much, I was naturally attracted to the musicals. And that's the ones that I had the most fun with. And I was just the most natural at. Uh, I also took some uh, classes in in high school uh, doing improv, and um, you know, going to and actually doing contests where we would, you know, have to perform these skits, you know, on the spot. And you know, the comedic <laughs> side of things was something I also enjoyed. So making things funny and listening, you know, I just I, I'm naturally better at the, the character voices as a result because they're kind of over the top and they're significantly different than my natural speaking voice so i was just involved in anything and everything performance you know show choir i I took dance lessons tap ballet um community theater i I, all throughout my upbringing i was i i I wanted to go to california so bad i wanted to go audition for anything and everything and um we just moved around every couple of years with my stepdad's career and um, I had just kind of start over with another small town, just trying to fit in. So it was a rough time growing up, moving around like that. Nine times before I was 16. Um, so I would just dive into whatever thing, you know, whatever activities involved, you know, singing, acting, dancing, all of that stuff in school. And then I pursued it in college as well and joined a show band at, at the age of 19. And I was on the road doing it for a, li- a living, you know, started at a young age and just never stopped never looked back that's amazing that's absolutely wonderful and i'm and i know you probably would have mentioned this cross in that last question i asked but who or what inspired you to really go into acting and who would you consider to be like your acting influences wow well mostly for me they would they would be um Garland. I mean, I, I grew up watching Wizard of Oz every time it came on TV and Grease, the musical Grease with Olivia Newton-John. So my biggest influence across the board would have been those you know, actors and singers that were in musicals and, and where they crossed the line of being actors that sing uh, or singers that act. So um, I would have to say Olivia Newton-John and uh, Judy Garland and Shirley Temple. I was also highly influenced by my favorite singer of all time, and that's Donna Summer, the queen of disco. Um, I grew up listening to her at the tender age of three, and I still to this day, you know, feel like she taught me how to sing because I, I listened so intently and memorized every nuance of her voice, of every album that I could get my hands on. That's all I wanted to do was listen to music, play music, sing all the time as a kid. It probably got a little annoying to some of my relatives and friends, but uh, (laughs) as a result, I had a lot of experience doing it. And and once I could get over that that hump of having some stage fright at like 10 and 11, uh, I knew that if I was going to pursue what I wanted, I'd have to get over that. And so I did. (laughs) I just kept getting on that stage and, and kept working at that and and just naturally got better and then once i joined the show bands i was i was on my way that's fantastic that's absolutely wonderful now looking back across at like your entire career from what what you've done before in the past to what you currently do now as not just an actress but in vocalist but primarily in the acting side of things do you walk into like a series or a project expecting to play a certain character or is it like a jack-in-the-box not knowing what to expect definitely not knowing because I, you know, I can get a slew of auditions all at once or nothing for weeks at a time. So basically it's a, it's kind of like no news is bad news because once an audition is set in, sent in, um, if you don't hear back, that obviously means you didn't get the role. Um, so, you know, I'll, I just try to be available and get as much exposure as I can. Uh, what's very helpful is to already have a, a, an established career of some kind with the, you know, being seasoned 
in voice acting, live performance, and recording on albums and things. So my Wikipedia page, IMDb, my website, all of that stuff has really been instrumental in <laughs> instrumental. That's funny, pun intended. <laughs> in um, in my overall career, uh, specifically over the past few years, is that it's just you know it's, it's been like a lifelong resume that's just things just get slowly added to it and then it just kind of builds from there and now you know this year last year and this year i'm really focusing a lot on um traveling on the weekends and doing in-store signings and appearances meet and greets pop culture conventions and that's kind of what i've been focusing on um it's kind of like make hay while the while the sun's shining it's like that's what people are into and if there's a market for it and people are still into the work i did many years ago well then Fantastic! How 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 uh, very, it's a blessing, and it's uh, something that I just absolutely do not take for granted. Because you know we all have the ups and downs of this industry it can be very very cutthroat, and I, I've definitely been involved with a lot of situations that were very very extremely competitive. And, and a lot of times we get a lot of no's. We get a ton of no's, and and we're not cast in in, in it seems like anything. And then you just get one key role or one or two really cool roles that that get you national international attention which i believe the dragon ball z thing obviously has so and for that i'm grateful you know and from there i you know i've I've gotten a few roles uh, on cartoon network that are non-anime roles um because they knew of my work on dragon ball and dragon ball z that's amazing that's absolutely fantastic now as mentioned about of course with uh, dragon ball dragon ball z and especially a lot of anime series now as many anime fans will know that anime is typically based on manga have you ever read the manga for any particular series that you've worked on or ever became familiar with a project you've worked on before you started working on that series no not at all um in fact when i you know when i got the audition for you know the dragon ball z audition i i wasn't even told was not even told what it was for um i didn't know what anime was this was you know 1998 um you know we didn't even have cell phones yet i guess cell phones were around but we didn't have you know a lot of that technology so there was you know the rewinding fast forwarding and things like that uh but when i showed up for the audition i i i just auditioned for Uh, the roles that were women that were female and that would just seemed like the natural thing to do we were able to you know choose which one we wanted to read for one or two and in the audition on the spot right before i was finished you know the three directors that were casting the show asked me if i could do the voice of a young boy and having been around kids growing up uh, and stepbrothers and brothers and things like that I had references and, you know, and from performing live on stage, I, you know, wasn't shy. So I gave it my best shot and, and, you know, definitely was thrown off and didn't understand why or they were asking me to do that. Uh, and then, you know, invariably about a week later, I found out I was cast as the, as the role of Gohan. And I'm like, oh, hey, that's great. This is awesome. But who's Gohan? What is this all about? And so I, I didn't know anything about anime. I didn't know anything about the show. Uh, I just showed up for the session and we just dove right in and from there I learned more about the show anime that it had originated in Japan we were dubbing it in English uh, and then I had to learn about the story and the other characters and because we recorded one at a time we didn't record um, all together we didn't we didn't record that way so I had to depend on uh, my imagination as well as the direction from the director really solely on those things to come up with the voice and then from then on i would just mimic myself which thankfully i had a lot of experience mimicking you know characters on tv bobby hill king of the hill beavis and butthead the simpsons i i was very active in you know mimicking those voices for fun just to see if i could do it you know it's like a challenge that i that i found myself <laughs> i still to this day will hear voices and oh that's an interesting voice i wonder if i can produce that sound or i wonder if i could make up a character you know voice for for my demo reel you know it's like it's just a constant constant creative energy that's kind of flowing through that's amazing crazy, and crazy i think that's fantastic I, I think that's really fantastic you're still keeping that constant creative flow going within uh, within the acting world and applying that into 
other aspects of your life as well. And it reminds me of like this, um, a couple of these interviews that I did where I spoke with, um, with Aaron Roberts and Amberly Connors, who are huge, like, geeks in real life, that they've actually read the stories for specific anime that they would later go on to voice in. So they would go in having an idea for what the story was about, the character, all those sort of things. Ah. But on the other end of that equation, you've also got actors like Joshua Seth, who many people remember from the Digimon universe, where he spoke oh, about... Yeah, where, he's such a fantastic actor, that guy. Where he spoke about how he got one advice from one actor who said, don't read ahead, just go in there completely surprised. Which I think is a fantastic approach to have, you know. Right, and I hadn't done a significant amount, well, I hadn't done any anime voice acting, so I was relying strictly upon the directors to basically throw me a ball to, to, to take a smack at. You know, it's like I didn't, I just had to just learn the etiquette. I had to learn how it went and, and you know, really having to be patient because, you know, there was a lot of rewinding and fast forwarding and, and things that were going on that, you know, we weren't literally going line to line to line, um, although we were, you know, efficient at it. Eventually, we all kind of got used to it and got better at it, which therefore made, made the, the process more efficient. But um, but you were asking about the, the manga. I, you know, I saw a lot of that after the fact. Uh uh, in fact, I was traveling with my show band, Vince Vance and the Valiants, um, which originated in 71, 1971 in New Orleans, and I joined in 1991 at their 20th reunion. Um, we actually got a, a, a tour um, over in Italy, and when I was there, this was a year and a half after I'd been cast as Gohan. My mom had just suddenly, unfortunately, passed away uh, at my age, so I was going through a lot, but I was in uh, Italy, and I was just walking around uh, at the souvenir shops and I just started seeing Dragon Ball Z stuff everywhere. And I was just like, that's when I kind of think I realized how globally uh, known that this, this show had transcended, you know, out, out of Japan and was being dubbed all over the world. And that's when I kind of think I finally started to realize just how big it was. And even to this day, I'm still blown away and amazed by it. But it was a big, like, that's when I saw like the manga and the you know t-shirts and sweatshirts and then i turned on my tv and dragon ball z was being shown in italian and i'm hearing the the actor for for gohan in italian coming through my you know my <laughs> hotel television it was like what is happening here i felt like i was in the twilight zone <laughs> so i'm seeing a lot more of what you're speaking of now that i do a lot of these meet and greets and these um guest appearances and i see uh, fans come out from all over bringing me these amazing items that they'd like to have signed, whether they're from Japan or they're their own original artwork or, you know, the manga or they want their video game signed, you know, the, the cover of their video game. Uh, some of them bring the VHS tapes from years and years ago well, that they collect yes. or that they watched when they were growing up. And I hear the stories about how they would run home from school or they had to get home in time to watch Dragon Ball Z or they'd get a speeding ticket on the way home from school <laughs> as a teenager trying to get home to see Dragon Ball Z. And it's just amazing to hear how it's affected so many people and families and, and, you know, kids that grew up watching it and they're watching it again with their children now. It's just, it's crossing two or three generations now. Absolutely. It is definitely an anime series that has stood the test of time. And I will definitely go on account to say that, like, it is up there as one of my top three favorite anime of all time. With, alongside oh, wow. Pokemon and One Piece. Those three being oh, the top okay. of... The top three in my opinion just the dragon ball franchise as a whole followed by pokemon uh -huh. and followed by one piece those three at the top of my list right there so it's definitely wow. it's Good definitely an anime, it's definitely an anime that is still very close to my heart because i still to this day for anyone out there that doesn't know i actually still have the four star dragon ball that i got at a comic convention when i met sean schmall the voice of uh -huh. adult goku for the very first time i think it was back right. nearly Almost nine years ago, I think it's been. I still okay. have that and a Dragon Ball keychain that I've got attached to one of my drumstick bags. So that wow. shows that shows what a big fan I still am to this day forward. Yeah, then I've been over there uh, to Australia actually f a total of four times in wow. the last 20 years, 21 years. 2002, 2004, 2012, and 2018 for yep. a reunion. So yeah, it was the uh, super, Supernova. Um, and then Armageddon in New Zealand. But yes. It's been a while. But I have a huge fascination 
and love for uh, New Zealand and Australia so so much. The absolutely by far the, the the most amazing places I've ever visited in person in my life. I'm really grateful to hear that, and that really warms my heart to hear. Like especially a lot of the voice actors talking about my country in such a really fond way like that and i feel the same way about and i feel the same way about the states as well like having gone up to the states myself on holiday it's it's so fantastic and everything and yeah that that's that just really warms my heart so thank you for saying that and we speak the same language it's like there's there's the language barrier is not it is not a problem at all absolutely uh, everybody was so friendly and accommodating and hospitable and uh, I'm from the south, so I, I that I respond well to that, and I'm the same way. So I just I really bonded <laughs> with the people. And I just wanted to to take a little Australian kid home. I was like, they're so cute and sweet, and that accent is just <laughs> it melted my heart. Oh, thank you for that. That's that's absolutely wonderful. Now yeah. going across now going across into one of your most well known roles. Now your most best known role is of course as the voice of Kid Goku in the original Dragon Ball series. What was it like to play that character, and especially to jump into a show that would have become so renowned to a lot of people all over the world? Well, you know what happened, the way I remember it, is I had already been cast as Gohan, and he was, you know, a young child. He was not necessarily, um, I mean, he was a prominent role in a way. He wasn't the lead by any means, but uh, he was... He was uh, uh, one of the main characters, um, and, and but when I was cast as Gohan, you know, he's kind of a background. He's, he does a lot of reactions and and shock and awe, emotional type, you know, crying and and maybe just screaming out, "Don't hurt my daddy!" and things like that. And as as the as the time as time went on, um, I think well over a year and a half or more, I I. First of all, didn't know about Dragon Ball. I didn't know that there had been a series that had was com- you know completed before Dragon Ball Z. But one day, I just showed up to work and I was asked to provide the voice of Goku as a boy. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I just kind of went with the flow. And you know, I I'd had to Im- you know do improv and, and roll with the flow in, in a lot of different you know career jobs and different kinds of things with it, whether it be, you know, like I said, the improv or acting or ad-libbing, um, and, you know, and, and, you know, performing live as a character for so many years. So I just went with it, and um, the director, Barry Watson, said, okay, so this is Goku. He's, he's, he's Gohan's father, but he's a boy. This is, this is a story that's, and he just kind of set up the, the background of the story and told me to pitch the voice higher, which was made it easier for me being a, a female it was much easier and not as hard on my voice to not have to constantly bash it with the screaming and the yelling but but not having to to have a gruff voice or a rough you know raspy voice he was kind of more like up here i'm goku he's you know he's younger he's chipper more chipper he's more innocent he you know and so i just basically gave them my rendition of of what was described and the next thing i know i'm being called in to record more so at that point I, I figured that was kind of an on-the-spot audition for it being that the director kind of knew um the diversity and versatility of my voice being that he had heard me sing he heard me you know come come in time and again to voice for gohan and many other background characters like east kai and baby trunks and you know a german english teacher and some of the villagers and the women crying and this baby screaming and you know so he knew um i had a range and that, that my voice was palatable uh, not uh, malleable i guess is more the word that it was um something he figured i could i could do and thankfully he liked my rendition of Goku's voice and therefore my career as Goku and Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball GT later on was born and um, I had an absolute blast recording his uh, his lines and um, his innocence and his the humor and the slapstick uh, naivety of Goku was absolutely hysterical and I, I just fell in love with it and it's like I could be this 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 little boy that in real life could, I could never really be and so I just channeled all of that energy through his uh, through his delivery and I really felt like you know that's when the acting came in it's like hey you you're a different character yeah your voice may be similar and you're related but this is a completely different character that you're encompassing here and so I just 
and I just embraced him from the get-go and was really happy that the directors were happy with my rendition. Absolutely, that is fantastic. And I will definitely say straight off the bat, having watched the original Dragon Ball series, like, I think just uh, three years ago, I believe it was, just as we were about to get out of that first year-long lockdown, it was it's still an amazing series, and you and the other actors across the board did a fantastic job in the show. It was so amazing, and it was such a fantastic uh, series. Thank you. I, I love uh, uh, a lot of my castmates. I see... Uh, at these pop culture conventions because sometimes they'll group us together or we'll do like an OG reunion with the, the OG ladies, you know, like Linda Young as Frieza and Chi Chi as, um, you know, Cynthia Krantz and then Tiffany Bul Vollmer, who's the voice of OG Bulma. And so we've gotten to be friends and, and we, you know, we, we cross paths on social media and we promote each other and, you know, try to encourage each other. And um, we have fun talking about the old days, you know, back when it, back when it all began for us. Absolutely, and especially Dragon Ball being such a really big influence on a lot of action anime that would come later down the track, like obviously One Piece, which was very much inspired by the by Dragon Ball at the time, as the creator had spoken about, where he said One Piece was very much inspired by Dragon Ball as a franchise, which is so fantastic, and Dragon Ball having such a really big impact on a lot of action anime, a lot of shonen anime, and just anime just in general at that time. It was so amazing, and going yeah. and especially going into Dragon Ball Z, which took it to the next step basically in terms of the story, in terms of the mythology and everything. You also you obviously spoke about voicing Kid Gohan at that time, and you obviously spoke about voicing Kid Goku, who's a vastly different character to Gohan in Dragon Ball Z. How did it feel, especially to work on such on like those two characters on two completely different shows? Well, I just found it to be. A, a super fun challenge like I said I mean I'm on I'm, I'm a I'm my, I'm my own worst critic but in a good way I, I want my voice to sound completely different I want to encompass the character and not be confusing the two voices and so you know of course I had a, a director to keep me on track and to follow direction but but you know I also wanted to do a good job I really wanted to these character voices to be genuine and sincere and to really capture the essence of that character and 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 be embraced in return you know I, I really wanted it to be good you know really really good and a lot of times when I was recording if I didn't get the line right after watching it and trying it for the first time with you know with absolutely no no pre-roll uh, I would a lot of times figure out within just a split second what to do to make it right and I would literally like record it right after and the you know they would keep keep it rolling in the event that this would happen and then you know the director kind of got used to this arrangement and if I didn't get it the first time I would almost always get it the second time and then they could slide it into place in post-production so um yeah I mean I I just really wanted it to be good I wanted the I didn't um I, I gave it 100% every time in the in the booth, you know, focus on that character and, and read ahead on the next line when they're fast-forwarding or rewinding or whatever they're doing so that I could almost, I would try to memorize the line because that way I wouldn't be inhibited by the logistics of looking at the screen and then looking down at the, at the, the script, which was on paper at the time. We would have headphones and a microphone. I, I always wanted to try to kind of watch the screen intently. So, um... It was always a benefit to, if I could, memorize the line, one one or two lines at a time, so that when I'm delivering it, I don't have to worry about that. It's already submitted to memory. And and being a singer and memory memorizing lyrics of hundreds and hundreds of songs over the years, thankfully, that's always been one of my, um, uh, it's just come easy for me. You know, it's a, I started memorizing things as a kid. I, you know, in school, I memorized. I went to a parochial school for a year, and I memorized Bible verses. And it just, you know, I made so basically made songs out of things I had to memorize, and it helped me remember it. So uh, that was a, I think, a key factor. So, so that there's never any indication that we're, that I was reading a line. I wanted to deliver the line as if I was really that character. So uh, I'm just glad I had the opportunity to work with with Barry. Um, he was very helpful and instrumental. In fact, he. Um, knew what he was looking for during the audition process because the girl before me who had recorded Gohan and Goku I th well I don't know if she did Goku but in Dragon Ball Z the OG Ocean dub from Canada was what 
he'd been working on previously. So the entire franchise was moved down to Fort Worth, Texas and recast entirely uh, with actors and actresses from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which is a crazy amount of talent. And um, so that's kind of, you know, they were already, they already kind of knew where they were going to be going and what they needed because they'd already been recording it before. Wow, that's that's incredible. And that's definitely true in the fact that we've had so many anime over the years that has been redubbed, depending on what the company, of course, is that is working on that. Uh-huh. What's been your opinion about anime going through such redubs, not just in the, in like, a, for example, as the ocean dub, as you just mentioned, but also with Dragon Ball Kai, which brought back most of the original actors, but also ended up recasting a lot of those those actors as well. What's been your opinion right. about what's been your opinion about anime being redubbed like so many times? Um well, I mean, I, I can tell you from my experience, you know, I hear a lot of feedback um from the fans. In fact I I was one of the ones that was not asked to return for Kai or Super. Um uh, I know for Super I think uh, uh I'm not familiar with the show, but I know my characters had already grown up. You know, Goku and Gohan, um they you know, they were obviously given to male character, male actors to voice them, um, like Gohan, you know, as as once he goes to high school and beyond as adult as Kyle Bear, and of course Sean Schimmel's uh, the voice of adult Goku. So I kind of knew my work had already been finished, but when Kai came out, I didn't know anything about it. Um, I was uh, performing and traveling with, you know, still traveling with the show band, and found out from the fans that um, Kai's been released and that. There's just several of the voices, the key voices are not there. There's somebody else, and you know there were fans that wouldn't watch it. They couldn't, they couldn't grasp, you know, the, those changes. And some, some were fine with it. Some, some don't. Uh, started watching it as a kid from Kai on, and so they might not even know really who I am or my voice. But um, you know, I think it's 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 important to try to stay consistent. If if you know, for the fans' sake, for if the, if the, the work is being done well. Uh, then why change, you know, why change the actors around? But it's happened to me several times. I mean, even the, the OK KO voice that I was at KO in the OK KO Let's Be Heroes and Cartoon Network um, prior to the um, pandemic, primarily the years of, I want to say, 2012, we did the pilot, and then we started recording it when it got picked up in 2016. So um, 15, 16, and 17, I recorded for OK KO, but then all of a sudden, uh, they, I was replaced in that one too because I didn't live in LA. I was the only out of state um, voice actor. And prior to uh, the pandemic, they, they, the, somebody from the higher ups and the corporate side of things didn't want, didn't want that anymore. So I, you know, it, it happens. It's very painful to, to, to embrace a character and think that you're going to be always come back for all the video games and all the movies attached to it, and then all of a sudden it's somebody else. And it's, it, but you know, I, I try to maintain a professional. Uh, attitude, and I'm happy for anybody and everybody who gets cast and whatever, but I think there's just a, a really tight-knit group of people that were still working there, and then they just they just recast people um, based on, you know, knowing them and working with them on the regular, and so um, it, it, it's, it's unfortunate it happens. I mean, I'm definitely, the, you know, kind of got kicked in the stomach there, especially not being told ahead of time. Um, but, I mean, I think that, you know, if somebody's not doing their job or there's something they're doing wrong or um, it, they can't do the voice anymore, that's one thing. But uh, but if you're doing the voice well and the fans like it and there's a great, you know, a fan base, then I think that it just kind of shakes it up a bit and makes it confusing. No, that's fantastic. I definitely agree on that. And I will say straight off the bat with this that... I feel like Colleen Klinkenbeard, who was the voice of Gohan in Dragon Book High, she did a fantastic job in the series, and she's an amazing voice actress. There's no question about it. But you will forever remain important to the legacy that you started with Dragon Ball Z and with the original Dragon Ball series. Thank you. Yes, I mean, there's just, just fans that just love those OG voices. You know, they just they become attached to them. They grow up with them. They, they become part of the... They kept being ingrained in their childhood. Just like for me, Donna Summer and Olivia Newton-John and Judy Garland. Like these voices are part of my, my upbringing. And to this day, when I hear those songs or when I listen to those musical arts or I watch those movies, it takes me back to when I was a child. And so they become ingrained and they become something that you become used to and so when they're changed out it's you know it's it is what it is um but it's um it's it's difficult 
for some people to, to grasp that whole concept. I know that some, there's a lot of fans out there that won't watch Kyra Super at all, but there's others that love it. So, you know, I, I respect for other actors and, and for whatever the reasons are, um, and, and there's really nothing I can do about it. So I just kind of, like, move on and, uh, you know, a door closes, another one opens, or I, I pave the way for something new, you know, something brand new. And um, so I'm always on the lookout, um, and my eyes wide open, and stay involved in, in sharing the gift that I've been given. And, and if I make good decisions, then things turn out okay. Absolutely. And I think that's a really fantastic attitude to have right there as well. Now, the other thing as well, that when people think of Dragon Ball is they think of the Dragon Ball GT series, which you came back and voiced Kid Goku for the role, but you also voiced a version of Kid Goku in the film as well, which was set after the events of the orig- of Dragon Ball GT. What was it like playing in Dragon Ball GT, and what was your opinion on the series within the Dragon Ball universe? Well, I was absolutely thrilled to death to have a shot at, you know, some more work for a few more months or a year or whatever it was from start to finish for GT. Uh, I was able to work with a completely different director and a different ADR director and uh, a couple of new cast members. Elise Bowman played Pan, and I still do events with her on the regular. We've got one coming up in California um, at the end of this month. Um, so, I, I mean, I was happy to, for the work, um, grateful to be thrown into the mix. And the cool thing about being Goku as a boy, but with the mind and the experience of an adult, was yet another challenge. It's like, okay, I can be this Goku voice. That's that's great. Um, but let's let's really hone even more so into the acting chops to really deliver these lines from the perspective of, of an adult, but through the voice of Kid Goku. So it was like, okay, let's let's really dive into those those acting skills and really try to make that just slight change very very slight but enough to really do a good job at at the delivery of the lines and really come from a perspective of, of an of an adult male so it's just another challenge that i that you took on i had a lot of fun with it that's fantastic that you really see it like that as well as the fact that as with the case with a lot of dragon ball series there is a lot of screaming in there which I'm surprised that, like, no one has shot their voice out from the amount of screaming they do <laughs> in the Dragon Ball series. I know. I did blow my voice out, um, p- particularly in the Cell Saga, when I was Gohan in the Cell Saga. Um, Super Saiyan 2 Gohan, big stuff there. Um, not only was he speaking like a, as manly and gruff and grovelly, I don't know if those are good words to explain it, but uh, <laughs> as most tough Clint Eastwood basically badass voice that you could I could come up with um delivering the lines in that low register um and then screaming immensely uh, and usually we would save them for the very end but it'd be over and over I mean I would leave with a big headache and my throat would just literally be on fire but um I did what I had to do I wanted you know like I said I wanted to do a good job and I wanted it to be believable so I, but I also knew I was resilient. I've been singing in a show band for, at that point, for well over 12 years, and um, even longer, I think. And, and so I was constantly using my voice, and I had the chops, thankfully, because I was singing with a rock and roll touring show band with, you know, nine or ten people on stage at one time. So, And we were singing pop, rock, R&B, soul, jazz, Motown. We were doing it all. And, you know, sleeping on airport floors and switching from airplanes to cars to... <laughs> planes, trains, and automobiles, and, you know, so I, I, I and I was younger, you know, I, I could handle it, I had a lot of resilience, and I think, in a lot of ways, I think that's why I was able to do as well as I did with that character, because I'd had so much experience bashing my voice already with rock songs, you know, singing rock and roll, wow, you know, just <laughs> letting it out, you know, letting it rip. No, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. And, of course, now the Dragon Ball universe is still going incredibly strong, having had the Dragon Ball Super Series, but also a lot of the movies that are coming out lately. Will we hope to see you come back into the Dragon Ball universe, even playing a completely different character? Well, I'm always open for it, that's for sure. You know, I was able to to voice East Kai, you know, Oh my, I'm the queen! You know, she's got this crazy, insane voice that's nothing at all like Goku or Gohan. Who would have thought that was going to happen? 
So I'm, you know, I'm always up for auditioning for any and anything involved with the, the Dragon Ball Z fan. I think that a lot of those directors have moved on, and they've got a lot of new talent that they've been working with over the past, you know, decade or so. Uh, I, I am, you know, in the scene in the area, you know, meaning like Dallas Fort Worth, you know. Um, but it's been really difficult to get back into that company. It's it's grown so much, and there's just so much. Um, talent from all over and it like i said it's just extremely competitive um but I, I find that it's just very difficult to even just get auditions there i've gotten a few and i've done a few background vo voices um but no, i don't know what it is about it um but I'm, you know, I'm i'm always available and if an audition comes in i i, I submit you know so far i just haven't gotten anything really substantial since uh since the end of i think um well since 2009 when i did my last work with the the last um video game wow but that would still be amazing though and fingers crossed yeah. it's gonna happen Thank sooner you. rather than later that yeah, is like a cameo you know the, the audience would you know the fans that have followed it all these years would probably really dig that absolutely that would be amazing now the other thing as well the people when they think about dragon ball is they think of the live action movie dragon ball of Ocean. <laughs> and <laughs> um did you ever get the chance to watch the movie yourself and what's been your opinion on anime being adapted for live action i have zero experience with any of that i wouldn't have a clue how to answer that i mean i've heard bits and pieces of things like that that were going on. I think it's great that anime is much more mainstream. I think that's fantastic too. I mean, I see a lot of uh, fans at these events and they really embrace it. And, and you know, it's kind of something that a lot of kids years ago got picked on for watching, like they thought they were weird or strange or dweeby or geeky or whatever. And, you know, the way I see it is I was always a misfit. I never fit in. I was always moving around and I was always the new girl. So I've embraced anime and you know retro events and and because i grew up geeking out about my stuff you know the 80s the you know the, the incredible hulk superman christopher reeves or wonder woman linda carter you know all of these you know characters that were in shows that i grew up with or you know well okay so if i was a nerd or a geek and, and you want to make fun of me for liking you know a certain kind of music well then so be it it's like it's a really great place to um allow people who are into anime come together and embrace each other and let each other express themselves creatively through cosplay through writing through original out artwork and me being such a creative person um i feed on that and i encourage that and so it's like i've got little anime babies everywhere you know i was no unfortunately not able to be a mom myself i wanted children desperately um and then lost two or three chances at it and so it's my way of to kind of you know seeing all these anime people of all ages coming together and then you know and, and embracing each other and it's 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 really heartwarming for me because i had been bullied um my uh, you know being the new girl and not really fitting in and most of them were small towns and i just it was a really t tough way to grow up and so i'm, I'm very protective of people that feel like they are being bullied or made fun of or because I have a soft heart for that because I went through it myself so I think it's great that it's it's more and more of a mainstream thing and you know people can it's almost like people can you know live Halloween all the time at these events and you know, they can dress up like their favorite character and 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 meet and greet other people who are have similar ideas and it gives them a place to express themselves I think that's a fantastic attitude to have right there and I definitely feel like with the live action anime adaptations out there, they're slowly starting to get better and better at working out that yes, we can bring this to live action, but it's just a matter of like adapting it in a way that makes sense. And it's not going to be exactly like it was in the original material, but there was almost other reports going about of them still doing a live action Yu Yu Hakusho series under Netflix, which to the listeners out there, let me know in the comments below. Do you want to see a live action Yu Yu Hakusho series? And leave a like or a comment if you really want to see Stephanie Naldini make a Stanley cameo in the live action series. That would be amazing. Yay! Yes, and the fact that I did the Sayonara Bye Bye song, and then I actually was the tournament announcer in Yu Yu Hakusho years ago. It's not a prominent character or, or role, but uh, I had I had you know I had a hand in there somewhere. Yeah, that would be that would be absolutely fantastic. So, with if they can manage to do if they can manage to finally nail the video game adaptations, anything is possible at this point. 
Uh, that's great news. I love it. I'd Absol- love to hear back from everybody and, and follow you on social media and see what everybody has to say about it. Absolutely. That would be fantastic. Now, another series you were also known for, and you've spoken a little bit about this, was OK KO, Let's Be Heroes as KO. What was it like playing that character in the series for such a short, even though it was only for such a short time? Well, it was it was completely new, a new experience in the sense that, first of all, it wasn't it wasn't anime, so there was no dubbing, there was no matching flaps, there was no that there was not a limitation with that. It was strictly, um, you know, getting direction and then delivering the lines in the way that the director wanted them delivered. So um, the only thing I had to go off of when I was chosen to be KO in Lakewood Plaza Turbo before the show was picked up by uh, Cartoon Network and then later changed to OK, the, the title was changed to OK KO, Let's Be Heroes. Um, so you know, we worked on the pilot and the developmental you know parts of the show and, and making it um, something that could be shopped around. Is, is this going to work out? Can we... Is, are you, you guys believe in this project and let, are we going to go forward with it? And fortunately, over a few years, that, that did eventually happen. So um, for me, it was somewhat easier because I wasn't stuck to the confines of matching lip flaps and fitting lines into a certain amount of time. It was just a matter of delivering them the way that they're being directed. And then the animation was was completed after. So it, so it was not anime and it was done and recorded in a different fashion. Um, it, it was a brand new show. It was a new idea. It wasn't something that we were dubbing in another language. So it was a completely different experience. And I got to go out to LA a couple times and tour Cartoon Network, which was a huge dream of mine, and meet the other cast members. And we recorded um, together uh, for a couple episodes where we were all in the same room. We all had our own microphone and we were literally working and and responding and reacting off of the other person's lines it was quite a, 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 an interesting experience and um i'd very much like to be considered for roles again at cartoon network especially now that it's much more acceptable and, and almost commonplace to record from your home or record from a studio uh across the world or across the states uh, you know and i definitely have my own setup now to be able to do that so i'm hoping some more opportunities come around and i'm definitely you know, uh, making it known that I'm available and um, I've got a demo reel that I'm constantly updating and promotional material. Might even consider getting another agent to see if there's other prospects out there. So, um, yeah, I was I was honored to, to provide that voice. It was just kind of an offshoot parody of Goku himself as a boy. So <laughs> it was super fun. No, that's absolutely fantastic. And I think because of the fact of what's been going on with Warner Brothers, for like the last couple of years, which of course Cartoon Network is part of in this case, that slowly now they're starting to work things out in this case of, because of the whole reshuffle with what's happening with Warner Brothers as a company and Cartoon Network sort of reshuffling things around a little bit to fit with what's going on. Anything is possible at this point and it would be absolutely amazing like for you to be, for you to be part of Cartoon Network again, even if it's not part of OKKO, OK if they ever decide to do a revival series, but that would still be amazing though. Oh yeah, I mean, I'd be I'd be open to whatever. I mean, I love the challenge. I love voicing characters, bringing them to life. I have a huge affection for children in general. So if I can voice in a cartoon that that caters to a, a, a young audience, then I'm all for it. Um, uh, my dream job would be to to be like, I guess something like a a Disney princess. To I guess is the only way to d- describe it, where I would be able to just sing and voice a character. And like on a light, like on a on a soundtrack. It's always been a dream of mine. That would be that would be absolutely fantastic. Disney, if you're yeah. if anyone at Disney is going to be listening to this, or Please. So, just get this happening because that would be amazing. That would be absolutely it fantastic. Would be awesome, yes, to be able to sing and voice because that's what I do on the side is I write songs and and produce them and put them out and they're mostly for children. Yeah, you know, a Halloween song, a Christmas song, they can be found on YouTube under my name and um a, a couple of them are saying as uh, saying like children's i utilize a, a little boy voice and a little girl voice and i made a song out of it and so i think that that's the novelty part of appealing to children i think is something that i've always really had an affection for 
That's absolutely wonderful. That is fantastic. Now here's a bit of a now here's a bit of a head scratcher with this question here. Now, what two shows have you worked on as a voice actress? Would you want to see a crossover between story wise and character wise? Wow, like a cr I don't even know if that could happen, but um, yeah, like maybe something kind of like. A Goku type or a Gohan character that could cross over into maybe something that's not anime at all. I mean, I know that there's some creative people out there that are doing some mashups and even some video games crisscrossing some some properties together. Um, as long as the licensing and all the paperwork's done and and nobody's breaking any any copyright laws, then I mean, I'm open to whatever. I mean, um, but I think more than anything, I think I just want to have uh, more opportunities to audition for. A variety of projects to where I can utilize other other voices. I mean, maybe some some female characters, or maybe a villain. You know, I'm I'm open for a, yet another challenge in in this in the industry. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Now, looking across at like the whole of the voice acting and the, and the animation industry, what's been your opinion on where the voice acting and the animation industry stands within the entertainment industry as a whole? Well, I mean, I, I've noticed more than more than anything, and I, I think it's sad. I mean, I think it is the the way of, of politics, and you know, whether it's Hollywood or New York or LA or whatever, whatever the studio is involved. But I think a lot of the mainstream, um, big, giant movies, animated features, have been utilizing already well-known, famous, seasoned actors to voice the characters. Um, and I think that there, it might have to do with money and power and pushing the film and wanting to make money on the film and utilizing big names to increase the audience and increase attendance or buying the tickets or streaming whatever it is they're working on. And I know a lot of us in the industry are like, well, wait a minute, we've been working, you know, 20 plus 25 years as voice actors, you know, don't leave us out of your project, give us a shot, you know, and I think that that, that things have been leaning towards that, you know, the Mario movie and, you know, um, not that they're not doing a good job, it's just that it's, it's making it harder. That and AI, um, there's, there's all kinds of the stuff going on with, with people, taking our voices and wanting to clone them to, to say whatever they want us to say and and to, to take the human factor out of it, uh, maybe to save money or to streamline, you know, the voice acting industry where they can just tell a computer to say what they want it to say. You know, it's 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 really scary that it's 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 directly affecting the creative nature yeah. of it. You know, the energy the creative energy is gonna be removed from that and that's that's sad. I mean, and I, I'd really like to think that it's not just all about money. It's, but a lot of times it is. And, and that's, I, you know, I've got, I know a lot of people that are amazingly talented that have never had a chance at anything mainstream. And, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of musicians. And my, my, my band in particular, the High Rollers, they're the absolute best at what they do. But, um, you know, we were, cover, we were a cover band and we performed at casinos and we were a house band for this and that. And it was amazing. But, you know, a lot of the, a lot of us, have never had a chance, you know, because of whatever reason, you know, we weren't noticed or we weren't, uh, we didn't have the technology or the money to push the, the marketing or the promotions. And that's, that's what's sad to, to a true artist, a creative artist. That's just, that's like our downfall. No, absolutely. I think it's, you've definitely hit the nail on the head. I think with all those points there on the voice acting side and on the musician side of that as well, where a lot of these really big mainstream movies cast a lot of huge name actors as opposed to like voice actors who've been doing this for so long. And I understand, of course, that's wanting them to try and get more people into seeing these movies and saying, hey, we've got this huge name actor voicing this really notable character, even though we've got the voice actor who's been voicing for 25, 30 years to do this just as easily in that. Even the, but I feel like if they can get Colleen O'Shaughnessy, who is the voice of Tails from the Sonic the Hedgehog games, to come back and do the voice of Tails in the movies, and right. even get Charles Martinet to come back and do cameo appearances in a Super Mario movie, I think anything is possible at this point. And I think on the AI side of things, I mean, I understand, of course, where that's coming from. I mean, if best example I can give on this, and I'm not sure if this is a true story or not, but 
famous story, I think, is James Earl Jones, who many people remember as Darth Vader from Star Wars, because of the fact he's so much older now compared to when he did Darth Vader back in the day. I think he had signed off permission for AI technology to be used for his voice, I think, just because he's gotten so much older now and he's not able to maintain that in the same way. So I understand where that's coming from, but at the same time, it's like, hey, these voice actors are still alive here. Use them. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's it's our it's our a lot of big part of our living and our um, our income. You know, it's our livelihood, and um, you know, and but at the same time, I mean, I do see a lot more of an online presence with you know, obviously YouTube, and there's so many other mediums in which to get noticed. So I know that that's going on as well. I mean, I know that if I had YouTube when I was seeing it on cassette tapes as a kid, you know, there would have been a lot more. Exp- uh, potential for exposure to producers or people looking for new talent for whatever um and you know i mean there's it's a dime a dozen now on these talent show competitions you know i mean i think there was one show when i was younger that was star search and that was the only one it's like it seems like there's just more and more outlets for people to be discovered but then you know you look at your age and it's like well i mean voice acting you can voice act forever because you it doesn't matter what you look like or what you're wearing or, you know, um, when you're recording. But, um, you know, I feel like, it, you know, you just have to work with what's what's given. And it's, it's you know, a lot of times growing up, I felt like I was kind of limited because there just wasn't a whole lot of um, opportunities, especially growing up in these small towns and stuff. But, you know, now that I, you know, once I landed in the Dallas-Fort Worth market, thankfully, I did find s- some options, you know, to be able to make a living doing what I love, which is performing, live performing and singing on albums and, you know, um, mentoring young singers to, to join the band that I was in. And I had a lot of, a lot of fun doing that. And, um, but I think that it's just important to, to, to not limit yourself. And I think that I felt like I just had to, because I didn't know there were so many other opportunities and other options. Um, but now that I'm, you know, I'm an adult and that, you know, I just sit down and do it, get up in the morning and hit the pavement and, and make things happen because you know we're basically here for a vapor and then boom we're gone you know we're not promised tomorrow so you gotta you gotta live in the moment and not live in the past or the future and really try to embrace you know where you are right now because yeah. that's all we've got you know i think that's fantastic advice right there that is amazing and i will go on record to say and i've said this across through all the interviews i've done and i will say this to the day i die if anyone was to ever ask me why is it that you still go to comic cons even though I'm like 30 years old now, and I'm like, I go primarily because of the voice actors. They're my rock stars right there. Oh, I love it. Me too. I love the other <laughs> voice actors as well. It, it's a, it's a, it really is a genuine talent, and it's, it, it takes a lot more work than I think a lot of people. And there's so many people that want to do it, and they just want to just jump in and get, a, and get cast in a role, and it's just not really how it's done. It's like there's so much that has to be put into it, and you have to really work hard doing it and being in the industry and refining your skills and you know taking workshops and getting advice and researching it and 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 practicing your craft and getting experience as much as you can it's it's not something that it usually is just handed it's not handed to anybody you've got to you've got to really work work at it and work for it absolutely i think that's really really true and looking across at the overall entertainment industry if you could change one thing about the entertainment industry, what would that be? Um, you know, I, it's uh, just getting rid of people who have an immense amount of power um, that are misusing it, that are that are abusing the, that power. Whether it's a famous director behind, you know, who's you know, making decisions um, that limit people or, or that if there's politics involved where somebody's not your friend, so therefore you get recast or somebody's not doing things the way that you want to do and then so you're out of there. I think that there's a lot of that going on and it's unfortunate and, and you know, it, happen in any, it can happen in any line of work really, but I think that, that if there's anything at all that I had to say, just people that have a lot of power in the industry and abuse that power. Um, 
because I think there's just a lot of talent and there's a lot of people in the industry who've been shunned or left out or misunderstood. You know, we get a lot of different personalities and a lot of different um, creative energy. And I think that that can clash with people or with certain directors. And I think there's a lot of people that are getting uh, slighted and, and not given opportunities that they, they've worked hard for and deserve. I, I definitely agree on that. And I think that's fantastic there. And fingers crossed that one day that change is going to come. We'll yeah. just have to wait and see. But yeah, not a question of if, really more of a matter of when, I guess. Right. But, but that's fantastic though. And I, that's definitely amazing. And without going into any spoilers, what's next for Stephanie Naldini for the fans to know about? What's next for me? Yes. <laughs> Sky's the limit. Um, I am, I mean, I've, I've got a big fire uh, going where I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon at all. I, I, I'm, I'm on my way to, to do whatever and is, is out there, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to record an album. I want to write music. I want to, you know, create, um, amazing material that can be utilized, whether it's in a soundtrack or, or maybe I'll come up with, um, material to, to do my own rock opera of some kind. Um, I've got all kinds of ideas. And then of course, obviously, you know, continuing to make voice acting, music, um, and any, anything show business, you know, the career for the rest for the rest of my days. Just, I, I don't plan on ever stopping. Um, even if it means, you know, um, getting back into some, you know, teaching and mentoring kids uh, that, May not, you know, maybe they come from a household that doesn't have a lot of money to put to get them, ex, you know, exposed or in the spotlight. Maybe I can be one of those people that can help people get more opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do on their own. Um, and then, you know, and also I have a big heart for um, a lot of good causes, like you know, the bully. I'm a huge advocate for anti-bullying, anti-racism, um, and for people who kind of fall through the cracks for whatever reason or you know sometimes kids or or even actors or whatever performers get involved in um, you know addictions or they might make some personal decisions that aren't, aren't really good ones or they're struggling or they're could be um uh suicidal i mean i know i went through a whole lot of personal trauma with you know not being able to have kids and i had a lot of stuff going on in my life and my, my life was kind of falling apart and i was you know was finding it hard to find um, a reason to, to go on. My mom has passed away and I, would, I didn't have a family. And, you know, um, so I have a big heart for causes where, for people who are struggling with life, life as a whole. I mean, it's it's a beautiful gift, but it's, we all go through struggling and um, that we can't avoid it. It's uh, uh, suffering, where the human suffering, the human condition is, it's just going to, to be there. But, um, so, you know, maybe I can make a difference in that way, you know, help other people who've been through situations like I have, you know, and um, kids that have gotten bullied or um, people that are, you know, don't don't have a purpose in their own life. And maybe I can have a make a difference with people like that. And, you know, whether it's, you know, through my work as a, as a voice actor or as a singer, or maybe I'll get into some kind of organization that helps people that went through these, these things or are going through it and need an outlet, you know, maybe I'll have something to do with that. That's absolutely amazing. I can tell you straight off the bat, with everything you've just said across everything that meant so much, that means so much to you, if honestly I turned my YouTube channel into a variety show here in Australia, and you were one of the guest stars on there, and you gave off something like that in front of a live audience, I think, I guarantee you they'd probably give you a standing ovation right now. Oh, I, that's sweet. I don't know. I just know that I just have seen it. I've experienced it, you know, and, and I've... It, it's very painful and you know uh, uh, and I've had debilitating anxiety in, in my life and a lot of struggles with loss and grief and to come out a survivor is beyond me I mean there's some kind of a resilience there that was that was somewhere in the human spirit and to help people find that and cling to it if, if it if that's all they've got well then if that's what gets gets them through and gives them a reason to live and a, and a reason to wake up the next day and hit it again then more power to them because there's just too much there's too much uh, negativity and people trying to 
cut each other down and you know there's a lot of hate on the internet and social media and you know I have to like really watch how much attention I personally give to that and and how much relevance I allow it to, to be in my life and and I think that that's a big deal nowadays more than ever you know is to really the struggle to really stay positive and focus on the the positive and and surround yourself with people who build you up and and not the people that that don't want you around or they don't want you in their show or whatever it is you know it's like really got to put that aside and move on and, and focus on what is good and surround yourself with positivity and try to be a positive influence on other people I think and that's it'll absolutely, come back to you. absolutely I think that's absolutely fantastic and I think if everyone had that same sort of attitude I think the way that you the way you just described it just right now, I think the world would be a better place to live in right now. It really would be. I'd just like to see more kindness. I mean, you know, there's only so much people can do, but at the same time, I think just simple, ongoing acts of kindness. Or there's really no, there's no monetary reward that can, that can make you feel uh, that good. The reward just comes right back to you. Absolutely. And final question, what do you think? What do you think Kid Goku would say if he was in Australia? Kid Goku. Yep. He'd probably say, "Hey guys, I sure am hungry. Can you guys show me where the food is?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's fantastic. That are like, what are all these tall things that are in the sky, and what are all these things on this in the water? You know, like because he, he doesn't know what boats are. And he <laughs> know anything about anything about any of that stuff he wouldn't know what was going on at all <laughs> no that that's absolutely fantastic that's just wonderful <laughs> or that, or like where can i fight where can i be do you guys have any tournaments that i can join <laughs> loves to fight no that's that's absolutely wonderful that's fantastic stephanie yeah. <laughs> that's amazing stephanie naldini thank you so much it's been an absolute honor same it was my pleasure i hope that the, the listeners are absolutely loving every minute of this absolutely and is there anything you'd like to say to the fans out there in australia and in the world oh my gosh i love you guys thank you so much for believing in me and for all of your feedback and all of your um your warm words your kind words i love hearing the stories about how what little i did contributed to uh, the benefit and uh, excitement or just being a part of something that's a, a healthy escape for young people and, and something that they can share with your families and, and help um, just continue to fight the good fight. And, you know, light over dark, meaning like, you know, really trying to, to do the next right thing. And um, I hope that that has shown through my work and my dedication and my and my love for my fans and just wishing you guys the best. And I hope I can get back out there again soon. Maybe next year. I'm hoping so much. I would love to come back. Absolutely, that would be amazing. That would be absolutely fantastic. Well, we Yay. are well, we are getting Oz Comic Con later this year, so fingers crossed. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, if you'd like to find out more about Stephanie Naldini, you can check out the links which I'll put to in the description below. Once this interview is officially up on YouTube, don't forget to like, subscribe, click that bell, check out the links, and don't forget to comment below if you have any requests or suggestions on both my Facebook page and YouTube channel. Thank you all so much for listening. This is Simon and Stephanie Naldini signing off. Bye for now. Bye. -bye.